Welcome to Light Shining in Darkness. Then the truth will set you free. You will hear experiences of God's love and guidance. May you be blessed by the Holy Spirit as you listen. Good morning. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Otto Morgan, here with Eric Wilson. How's it going today, Eric? Good morning, Otto. It's good to see you good again. Good to see you. You want to open with a word of prayer, and we'll get right going. Yes, sir. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for a beautiful day. Thank you for the time that you've given to us to fellowship and to open your word with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We ask for your presence, the power and wisdom and discernment through your Holy Spirit. Father, lead us and guide us and prepare us for that great day of your son's return. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our talk today is going to be continuing on the days of Noah as it was in the days of Noah. And I want to read that verse that I read yesterday. Therefore, this is out of uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, and it's the New King James Version that I'm reading from. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And today we're going to get a little more into those appetites about whatever we do and eating and how we need to glorify Christ and be conscious of what we eat and do and Amen. say. How we live, that's right. Christianity is not just what's in your head. It's not just a set of doctrines. It's the life. To know that you're a Christian, it's got to be seen in the life. Because a mere profession is worthless if there's not seen Christ in the life. It's interesting because that verse in, in 1 Corinthians 10.31 it says, whatsoever things we do, do all to the glory of God. When I was in the martial arts, I used to have people that would say, I'm boxing, you know, and I'm doing it to the glory of God. And I've even seen a, a number of uh, UFC fighters, you know, and I know they, they believe they're doing right, but they'll say prayer and then get in a, a cage and beat one another until Blood is all over, and they say they're doing this to the glory of God. That does not bring glory to God. You have to go to the Bible to find out what brings glory to God. There's a verse here in Psalm chapter 24. And listen to what it says, because he's speaking to us today. Psalm 24, verse 3 through 5. It says, Who shall ascend into the hill or mountain of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place, his congregation? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity or pride, nor sworn deceitfully. They made an oath and then not keep it. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. God tells us who's going to stand when he appears. Our God is a consuming fire, it says in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Our God is a consuming fire. Who will abide the day of his coming? Who is going to stand when he appears? Those that have clean hands and a pure heart. Now, I want to pick up where we left off last time. There's a, a quote here from a book called Councils on Diets and Foods. And I want to encourage our listening audience, if you want to do something as a Bible study, take this book and start reading through it and ask the Lord to lead you in his word as well as in the counsel that's given to us. Listen to what the author says. We meet temperance everywhere. And this was written over 100 years ago, so I'm going to put our day into the text. When I travel in the airports... When we get on a bus, when we get on a train, when we're at the mall, when we go to uh, a big gathering or a get-together, whenever we go, we see intemperance everywhere. We must ask ourselves what we are doing to rescue souls from the tempter's grasp. Satan is constantly on the alert to bring the human race fully under his control. His strongest hold on man is through appetite. That's interesting they use that phrase, his strongest hold. That's called a stronghold. A stronghold is when 
uh, you know, one country attacks another country. It's like, a, let's say that Cuba decided to attack the United States. Cuba's a little bitty country. If they were trying to attack the United States 100 years ago, they can't take over the United States all in one, one swoop. They would come in on one beach and they would occupy two acres or five acres of ground. And they would put as many men and tanks and whatever they've got there, how much ever armament they could get into that one little piece to hold that ground. Because once they've got their foot in the door, they don't want to get pushed back out. That's what a stronghold is. A stronghold, in this sense, is a place that Satan has found an open door into the life of a Christian. And he has placed his army there, his warriors there, in order to keep that ground. His strongest hold on mankind is through appetite. We talked about that last time. Appetite was what caused the fall in Eden. It was appetite. Eve wasn't starving. She hadn't went, you know, for three weeks without food, and she was dying for food. Appetite is more than just a righteous desire for food because one is hungry, and we're going to get into that. His strongest hold on man is through appetite, and this Satan seeks to stimulate in every possible way. It's funny because if something does not look good, most people won't want to eat it. What causes you first to want to eat something is its appearance. That's why a good cook or a chef, they know how to make it look appetizing. Appetite. They make it appear appetizing. Well, now you look at a lot of the food that we see in our grocery stores, and it's got neon blue and neon green and bright fluorescent pink, and you're like, how did they make that food that color? Because nothing that God made is that color except some of the fish on the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> but it's almost like it's glowing. And then you look at the ingredients list, and it's got red, you know, red number 40, which is a carcinogenic, and it's got who knows what other things that are worse than that. Four different sugars. Four di yeah, and, and most of them are artificial, or they've been so processed. Fried two or three times. That's right. At the factory, at the restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> so Satan is seeking to stimulate appetite in every possible way. And you know, it's funny because many Christians will say, yeah, but food's not a salvation issue. Well, then why is Satan so worried about it? He's seeking to stimulate it. He knew that's how he got Eve and Adam to fall. And he holds his strongest hold upon man is through appetite. The master of deception in today's, it's the master of distraction. People have an appetite for distraction. That's exactly Constantly right. Constantly to be distracted. Now listen to what the book goes on. This is Councils on Diets and Foods, page 150. All natural excitants are harmful. It's food that excites you. It excites the cells and the nerves inside the body. A lot of times we eat things, and I'm guilty. Because it makes you feel invigorated, but there's always a letdown. If there's a false invigoration, there's always a letdown. It says, all unnatural excitants are harmful, and they cultivate the desire for liquor. How can we enlighten the people around us and prevent the terrible evils that result from the use of these things? Have we done all that we can do in this direction in saving people from intemperance? Now, if you would, let's, let's look at a scripture. And Otto, if you would pick up here and read this for us. This is in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Yes, I'm reading out of the New King James Version. It says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Wow. Now, this is the thing that startles me. It says in verse 2, men shall be lovers of their own selves. 
Do you know that the entire gospel, even God's law, can be summed up as love? The definition we have in the Bible of love is, No greater love hath any man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. That means if I choose someone else's good over my own good. But here it says men are lovers of themselves. That means they prefer what's good for me rather than what's good for the other person. Then it says they're covetous. You know, they're lovers of money. It means they want what's not theirs. They're boasters. Look at what's happening now. I mean, look at the sports industry. I mean, you name it. Uh, Hollywood. Look at the corporate industry. Look at the music industry. Boasters. Proud. Blasphemers. Disobedient to parents. A lot of times we think of little children. You know what? I can look in the, in the Bible at Jacob's 12 sons. They were obedient to him when they were living righteously, even when they were in their 40s and 50s. My dad is 70, you know, early 70s. I still need to obey him. I still need to honor my, my father and my mother. That rule doesn't change just because I got older. It says they're unthankful and unholy. Well, we just read in Hebrews, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. It says these people are unholy. Then it says they're without natural affection. That means between a husband and a wife or a parent and a child. They're truce breakers, covenant breakers. They're false accusers. They're incontinence, what the King James says. And I like what your, what your new King James definition there was. It means they don't have any self-control. Another word for that in the Greek is intemperate. A lack of being able to control one's own desires. Then it says they're fierce despisers of those that are good. And we look in the world and we go, all that is happening in our world. But look at what it says in verse 4. They're traitors. They're heady. They're high-minded. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Would they prefer going to that movie than pleasing God? And I have to ask myself that. Am I watching something that I would feel okay with sitting beside Jesus Christ? If I sit down to watch a DVD or something on television, would Jesus sit and watch this with me? Now this is the part that really is startling. Look at the next verse in verse 5. It says they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. This is not talking about the world. The world doesn't have a form of godliness. These verses are talking about the church. Is that the Laodicean church it's talking about? Our day. Our day. Right before Christ returns. Every single thing that you read there is talking about God's people. He's not talking about the pagans, the atheists, and unbelievers. He's talking about us. That's eye-opening. Now, we're going to look here for a minute, because that one text there, it said they're incontinent. They lack self-control. There's another word for that when it comes to food. It's called gluttony. I believe there's a verse in Proverbs. I don't remember where right off the top of my head, but it talks about if a man be given to appetite, it's better that he put a knife to his throat. God does not want people to put a knife to their throat, but he's saying the results of you yielding to appetite, it would be better for you just to put a knife to your throat and not eat. When we look at today, gluttony has become the acceptable sin. You look at Super Bowl parties. I mean, I don't watch Super Bowl because there's so much paganism that's involved in it, and, and it, you know, it can be rough. I'm not condemning people if they do, but, you know, again, if, if Jesus would sit down and watch it with you, talk to him about it. Make sure. But when you look at the parties that happen while people are watching this, look at how much food is eaten. How about family gatherings? I mean, I know what it's like when my family gets together. Everybody brings a dish, you know. I actually bring three or four dishes. How about holidays? I mean, if you ask any woman about what she's going to do for Christmas or what she's going to do for Easter, it's all about the meal. It's all about food. And how many people that are studying with us right now can say, oh, yeah, I remember last Thanksgiving. I, I only ate what I needed. I, I didn't overeat at all. 
I mean, it's gluttony. You associate those holidays with different smells, cinnamon or yep. spicy, or the turkey cooking if, you, That's right. if you're a meat eater. That's right. And you know, it's funny too, because in the pagan world, almost all of those same days were celebrated as a time of inhibition. That meant you gave yourself up to feasting. You gave yourself up to what they would call, the Romans called them food orgies. I don't want to be crude, but they would eat and eat until their belly was so bloated, and then they would go take herbs to cause themselves to vomit so they could go back and eat again. That's how messed up they were. Can you imagine feeling so bloated after a Thanksgiving meal, but you wanted the taste again so bad that you would go in the bathroom and throw up just so you could go gorge yourself on food again? That's scary. That is scary. That's how it was during the Roman Empire, and we're living in the same time now. Look at restaurants. I mean, you know, if I remember the first time I went to uh, one of the, the Mexican restaurants that we have here in the area, and I'm not going to name the name of the restaurant, but you know, I ordered two burritos, and the man that took us there, he looked at me, he said, you'll only need one. And I thought, one burrito? I mean, that's not even going to feed a mouse. Well, then I saw the size of the one burrito after I'd already ordered two of them. There's no way. Right now, we are eating probably four times what is necessary to preserve healthy life. What about picnics? I mean, people go on a picnic and it's all about taste. It's about food, tasting a certain way. So we begin to eat because of the way it tastes, not because of nutrition or because of hunger. What startled me one time, I remember when the Lord was really helping me to see this because I was really struggling. I've never been overweight, but I could eat four times as much as I needed to easily, especially at a church get together. But the Lord, he opened my eyes to something. He told me one day, he said, Eric, I want you to imagine in your mind, your favorite food. You know, if you're listening right now, you can see in your mind what your favorite food is. Now, in your mind, take a, a spoon or a fork and get a, a bite of that and remember what that taste is like in your mouth. The taste only lasts until you swallow the food. The moment you swallow the food, the pleasure of eating it is gone. I've got to be careful how I say this. There's other aspects of humanity where the same principle applies. When it comes to marital relationships, a man and his wife being intimate with one another, all the buildup and the event that it is designed for only lasts for a few seconds. Same thing with food. You eat it and it only tastes good for less than 60 seconds. The moment you swallow the food, it's gone. That's why you have to have another bite. Now, all these things we just talked about, you know, the Super Bowl parties and family gatherings and restaurants. What if we take this home to the church? What about the last time we were at a fellowship dinner or what they call potluck dinner after church? I've been there before, and you want to talk about one of the hardest places to resist appetite? It was at church. And that's the one place that I should be the most careful with honoring God and how I eat and how I drink. You have trouble at the dessert table no it's just <laughs> period i mean like there's all those different foods there and you feel like you got to taste all of them and you know it's funny because we're not going to get into this but food combination is important too a lot of people will eat and they go man my stomach's upset well if you eat certain foods mixed with certain other kind of foods the enzymes that are supposed to be released like with fruit is a completely different set of enzymes that that are released with uh, beans, with legumes, with uh, protein, or with vegetables. Well, a good point of that, when I lived in Italy in the military, I would eat with some Italians in their home, and at the end of a big Italian meal with pasta and spaghetti sauce, and they would bring out fruit. And if you <laughs> ate that fruit, I mean, your stomach. Yes. And that it's like the, that's it, it was trying to that fruit was trying to go. That's right. <laughs> I mean your body was telling us, you know, but we don't listen. Yeah. We don't listen. 
Let's look at another verse that talks about this. This is in Jude, in the auto, if you'll get this one for us, it's in Jude chapter 1. Let me turn there real quickly. Jude chapter 1, right before Revelation. Actually only has one chapter. But Jude chapter 1, verse 17 through 19. And I'm reading out of the New King James. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause divisions not having the Spirit. Now that right there, I mean, this almost sounds like the previous verse that we read out of Timothy, the letter from Paul to Timothy. It says there would be mockers in the last time. Second Peter chapter 3 talks about that. Who walk... After That means live according to their own ungodly lust. That means desires. The word lust does not mean just sensual or immorality. It means desires, carnal, fleshly desires. And then it says in the King James, these be they who separate themselves. They separate themselves from who? From Christ. They are sensual. That means carnal not having the Spirit of God. And that's Jude 1, verse 17 through 19. Now listen to what Philippians says about these type of people. This is Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. It says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark those which walk so as ye have us for an example. Mark those that are walking that they're following the example we've given. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and of whom I now tell you again, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, and whose God is their belly. Wow. Wow. I know when I read that, I was like, and the Lord was speaking. He was like, Eric, I'm talking to you. Your God is your belly. And I was like, God, no, it's not. He was like, are you choosing to obey your stomach rather than obeying what my word says? Are you choosing to obey your appetite rather than choosing to obey what my spirit is saying to you? And I realized, God, this is idolatry. I've chosen to obey the voice of the enemy through my appetite rather than yield to the word of God. You know, it's funny, it says that these people are carnal, they're sensual, and it says not having the Spirit. They don't have the Spirit of God. And you know, Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 20, it says, here are the works of the flesh, and it gives a whole list of the works of the flesh. And then it says, but these are the fruits of the Spirit. And do you know what is listed in that list of the fruits of the Holy Spirit? Temperance temperance, self-control. That is the result of having the Spirit of God inside your life. And that really, it struck me. Now, Paul uses a word there that you don't find very often in Scripture. It's, it's sensual. And I looked that word up, and I, I like to look up words in an old 1828 Webster Dictionary, because back then, People knew what words really meant. Nowadays, you can't trust. I mean, definitions are changing almost now yearly. People, people get Wikipedia definitions. <laughs> that, yeah, and that changes by what's uh, right in man's eyes. Yes. But listen to, to the definition Webster gave in 1828 of sensual. It means gratification of the senses, the indulgence of appetite, fleshly, devoted to the pleasures of sense and appetite voluptuous, lewd, and carnal, sensual. We're living in an age that thrives on that. Well, they've created whole, whole little uh, cottage industries around it, or even bigger than that, with pairing wines with certain type of foods. And all oh, these, this, will, this kind of meal will go great with that red wine from Argentina you're drinking. <laughs> And what it's kind all of about, meal are you preparing? We can recommend some wines for you. It's all about money. Somebody's making money yeah. off of that. Listen to this statement that's found in Testimonies, Volume 4, page 31. 
Intemperance of any kind is the worst sort of selfishness. This spoke to me. Selfishness is the opposite of Christ. So how can I be selfish and yet still gain the kingdom of heaven? Selfishness is what caused Judas to lose eternal life. It says those who truly fear God and keep his commandments look upon these things in the light of reason and our religion. How can any man or woman keep the law of God, the law of divinity, which requires a man to love his neighbor as himself, and yet indulge in temperate appetite, which benumbs the brain, weakens the intellect, and fills the body with disease? Intemperance inflames the passions and gives loose rein to lust and carnal desire, and reason and conscience are blinded by the lower passions. Lower passions are, are the base things that are needed for the body. You know, reproduction, you know, food, you know, indulging in food. It, it takes away the brain and the intellect as ruling over the body, and it puts the body ruling over the intellect. I think one of the most powerful weapons that the devil uses against folks is alcohol. Amen. Because it's so easy to fall into that trap of overindulgence in alcohol. And Amen. That, along with that comes with overindulgence in food, and your inhibitions are taken away, and you overindulge in all kinds of wrong things. Do you know what, what's amazing, what you just said? When we overindulge appetite, our inhibitions are dissolved. It's like it breaks down a wall that God put there in the intellect, in the mind. It also breaks down a wall that the Spirit of God has formed around us to protect us from Satan. When I begin indulging appetite, it becomes harder to hear the Spirit of God, God's voice through His Spirit. The Word of the Lord is coming to us, but it, it's almost like our ears are getting clogged because the belly's being full. It doesn't mean you shouldn't eat. It doesn't mean you should starve. But we should eat in order to live, not live in order to eat. And you can eat some really good, healthy things that taste good, that are healthy, and you don't, and eat slower. That's and right. I'm, I'm guilty of eating fast, but there are some really good, healthy things you can learn to cook and eat. Do you know what's interesting? If you eat a salad... It's hard to overeat on salad. And the reason why is because you chew. I mean, if you've got carrots and you've got broccoli and you've got stuff that your, your mouth has got to chew, you don't want to be chewing. It's easy to overeat when I've got a meal that comes on a spoon and I can pretty much, I don't have to chew. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, uh, I go to a Mexican restaurant. You don't have to chew most of that. I mean, you, you bite it off, put it in your, there's not a lot of chewing involved. You know, if you've got a little bit of meat in there, maybe. But by making food go down faster, it makes it easier to indulge appetite. Like Gomer Powell said, you got to chew your food 13 times. <laughs> I remember my grandmother said it was much longer than that, <laughs> but <laughs> she may have been right. Well, again, here's another show. This is going by really fast, Eric. So I just want to remind folks they can give us a call at 828-692-1190. Leave a message or comment. And you can still enter into our DVD giveaway. And you can email us at wfhcfm at gmail.com. Please remember our times are Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. And the same show again on Thursday at 11 a.m. So I'd like to just close in a quick word of prayer. Yes, sir. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for another episode of information of your word going out, Lord, that we're sharing with people. And we pray that the message you will get to them and make them think and question, put those things before you and ask for guidance, Lord. We thank you for all you've done for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll see you next week. We hope you were blessed by what you heard today. Remember, we are looking for Jesus' second coming. You can contact us by email, wfhcfm at gmail.com or call 828-692-1190. We welcome your questions or comments.